care of them, meeting their needs, so to speak, providing for them, that's an opportunity for that to move to a place where we're just not focusing on material things, but spiritual things begin to happen. You never know when God might use the thing that you're doing in your life to bless others through hospitality. He might use that as a way to speak to you or to turn that situation into a very casual setting, into a very spiritual setting where you might speak into other people's lives or other people might (coughs) speak to you as God might use them to say a word to you. So what I want you to see is that through the simple thing of hospitality, how it can move to a place of fellowship, where we're just not talking about gathering around and these material things, but it moves to a spiritual place where we can hear a word from God and encouragement from God. So uh, bear with me as we work our way through this. It's going to take a couple weeks, but we'll get there. Um, so let me, let me share with you just a, just a picture of what that might look like. In 1 Kings chapter 17, uh, the prophet Elijah comes upon a woman, a Zarephath widow. God had already prepared her. He goes to her, and it's during a time of famine, and he wants something to eat. And so as he approaches, he asks, she sees her gathering wood by the gate, and he asks her for a drink. And she goes, and she's ready to get the drink. And he said, by the way, bring me some bread. He said, please first. But he said, please bring me some bread. And then she stops in her tracks and turns and says, you know what, I, I only have a handful of flour left and a very little oil. And uh, my son and I, we're about ready to eat our last meal. I've just gathered all these sticks to start a fire, and then uh, we're going to eat our last meal, and we're going to die. <laughs> wow. But she goes anyway, because Elijah encourages her that God's going to continue to provide. Just do this thing of hospitality. And so she does. And what happens? The flour never runs out during the, during the famine. The oil never runs out. She and her family continues to eat. It moves from a place of a simple act of hospitality into a very spiritual, powerful thing, a fellowship where you can just see the presence of God working. Then later on, her son dies. And Elijah is used by God to bring him back to life. Do you see how something simple like hospitality can make a huge difference in your life and the life of others? But most of all, how it blesses and honors God. It's a reflection of him. There was this story that I read about a vagabond going through the streets of, of England. And he is walking down the street and he noticed a sign in front of the house that said, George and the Dragon. And so he stopped and looked at that and he thought, well, all right. So he walks up, knocks on the door, and, and, and a woman opens the door and he says to her, do you have some leftover food? Well, she's looking so put out. She says, I do not have anything for you. And he goes, could you just spare maybe some clothing? And she said, no, no clothing at all. And he said, would you mind if I just went ahead and... She goes, I am so tired of listening to you. He goes, dude, would you mind if I just stayed in your stable tonight? And she said, no, and went to close the door and he stopped the door and he said, one more thing. Might I have a word with George? George and the dragon. Please, in the matter of hospitality, God does not want us to be the dragon. In times of hospitality, especially in this passage here, I know there's times you're going to be prepared knowing someone is coming to visit. That you have an opportunity to provide, to meet a need. There are going to be times where you're, number one, tested unannounced. The unannounced testing. We see in verse 1, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham in the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent during the heat of the day. Notice in verse 2, he's looking up when he senses their presence. I'm assuming at the heat of the day, the dude's 99 years old. He's probably napping. 
He was not expecting someone to arrive and have a need and for him to meet that need. You and I, we like things when we have an opportunity to plan for them and to see what's going to happen. Uh, my students in seminary, they, first thing, they don't want to know who I am. They don't want to know anything about me. They want to know the syllabus. They want to know when the test is going to be at midterm. They want to know when the final is going to be. They want to know, all, they want to know everything ahead of time. And that seems to be our, our nature. We want to know ahead of time all these things that are going to come in the future. But the real testing comes when we are challenged, our faith is challenged unannounced. Now, what is Abraham going to do? Now, there's extremes to testing. If you know about Job's life. Job is sitting with his boys. He's at the oldest boy's house, and they're all gathered around. They're drinking, they're eating, they're having a wonderful time. A celebration. A servant comes and tells them all the animals are dying. Another one comes, says all the animals died. Another one says, your, all your servants are dead. Over and over, and this guy's getting hammered. Was he expecting any of that? But you know what he says in chapter 13, verse 15, concerning the Lord, even if he kills me, I will hope or trust in him. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, it says, In him, don't be surprised when testing of your faith comes. So here is an unannounced test to Abraham, and what is he going to do? And you're going to have those opportunities to show hospitality unannounced, even at times when it is announced. Number two. The undeniable ministry. You, you, this is not an option. Number one, especially for those who have the spiritual gift of giving. The spiritual gift of giving. If you turn to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, down in verse 8. Some of you have, the, how many have the spiritual gift of giving here? No, we don't want to know who you are because then we're going to be starting asking you for stuff. So <laughs> that's our nature as humans. So uh, most times those who have the spiritual gift of giving remain anonymous. They, they, they don't want to be known when they, they don't want their giving to be known. And uh, that person with that kind of gift we see in Where is it? Verse 8, chapter 12. They give with, genero with generosity. They give with generosity. But look at verse 13. Just because they're generous and anonymous, verse 13 tells us, share with the saints in their needs. So meet a need. A person with the gift of giving is going to be naturally someone who gives, but it says also pursue hospitality. <laughs> naturally, for a person who has a gift of giving, God bless you all. That'll cover everybody right now. No more. <laughs> but that, that, um, that spiritual gift of, of giving, you need to be generous and then uh, practice hospitality. Put a face to your giving. Let people know that they're welcome and, and you're going you're gonna to be there to, to share what God has given you to, with them. Okay? So it's natural for a person with the gift, of gi uh, the gift of giving to be hospitable. It's also commanded of them to do that. Uh, also, you'll see that in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, in Titus chapter 1, verse 3, it's the responsibility of the overseer. They're to be hospitable. The elders are to be hospitable. So the church leaders are to be people who are hospitable, practicing hospitality. Now you say, all right, well, I don't have the spiritual gift of giving. I don't have uh, the responsibility of an overseer or an elder. But look at verse 3. No, number 3, I mean. For those who are Christians, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9. It says, be hospitable to one another without complaining. Wow. That's not always easy to do. But do it. So the gift of spiritual gift of giving is to be hospitable. The leaders of the church, hospitable. And every Christian, every one of us are to be hospitable, practicing the 
ministry of hospitality. Number three, let's look at the unexpected guests. Moses comments what in verse one? When the Lord, Moses wrote this book in Genesis, the Lord appeared to Abraham. That's his commentary. And Moses understood that the Lord came. It's amazing what will happen when you practice hospitality. The Lord may just show up. Won't that be wonderful? In, uh, chap in chapter 18, verse 9, we know that it's the Lord because the Lord speaks to him. He says, where's your wife Sarah? They asked him. Notice how it says they asked him. It's almost like they were, all three were together. Some have suggested this might be a picture of the Trinity. Eh, probably not. But you'll notice that they all speak, they speak together. But look at verse 10. And then the Lord said, I will certainly come back. Okay, so to now, now we have the Lord speaking to him. Chapter 19, verse 1. It tells us two angels enter Sodom. So apparently, these three individuals that were standing there that met Abraham, two of them were angels, obviously. The third one, who speaks as the Lord, was probably the Lord. In his pre-incarnated state, in the Old Testament, it's an appearance, a theophany we call it, where the Lord appeared in the form of a man before Abraham. God was right there, speaking to him. When God shows up. Now, these weren't just ordinary travelers. Moses not only knows this as he writes, but Abraham seems to pick up on it. Number two, Abraham recognizes the divine visit. Notice how quickly he moves in this situation. He looked up and saw the three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran. I remember this 99 year old guy, he's running. See, he's becoming more familiar with the presence of the Lord. That's what God wants us to do. Become more familiar with him. People say, how do you know God's voice? How do you understand God? You see, because God doesn't speak audibly to us, does he? But he speaks to us. And how do you become familiar with his voice? Jesus said, my sheep will hear me and they'll know my voice. How do you become more familiar? By, by listening to what he's already said. Learn how he's speaking to you now. And, and the more you listen to him, the more you know it's him. And you're confident that he's speaking. If you see in chapter 12, it tells us that God spoke to Abraham. We're not, we're not told how, but he, how, but he, but he spoke. Verse 15, or chapter 15, it, it says that the Lord came to him in a vision, in a dream. So he's moved from speaking, now he's going to a place of a dream. Chapter 17 tells us that he pierced to him in symbols. So you can see from this progression that Abraham's becoming more aware of when God's speaking to him. So when these guys showed up and he looked up, they must have said something, and right away he what? He knew it was God. And so this guy starts putting feet to his responsibility, and he starts, he starts moving. Number three. We must anticipate the divine. When we're practicing hospitality, or hospitality somebody suddenly comes upon us, we need to anticipate a divine moment, a divine presence of God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12 tells us, anybody? Some have entertained angels unaware in practicing hospitality you may find yourself in a place where a messenger of god is right there and you're unaware of it god may just show up in a powerful way that may not be a real angel but trust me god's involved in it he can be involved in it Number four, we may not know right away that it is God. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. I encourage you to turn there. When Jesus, the Son of Man, comes in his glory, when the Lord returns, 
And what's going to be with him? Well, doesn't that sound familiar? The Lord comes with his angels. Well, that sounds like something just happened to Abraham. Verse 31. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Verse 37, then the righteous will answer him. This is where you and I go, I didn't know that. The Lord, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in, or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Even a stranger, it's as if you are ministering to the Lord God himself. And you may not even know it. It may not be an angel in underwear, or unaware, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it just may be the Lord. <laughs> things slip out, you know. And, and things, things slip out. Those are the ones that need clothing. <laughs> That's how you minister to those angels. <laughs> But eventually you will know that you've ministered to the Lord. He will let you know. So number one, unannounced test. They'll come. Number two, undeniable ministry. And number three, it's the unexpected guest. But number four, the uninhibited response. This guy, nothing stopped him. He knew, he knew it was before him. So you have to remember now, whoever comes and has a need, this is a real opportunity for you to minister to the Lord. Now, I'm not going to tell you that every single person that comes has a legitimate need. There are a lot of takers out there. Amen. But I think you need to be as wise as a serpent, but as innocent as a dove. Ask God for wisdom. Uh, I think he'll guide you in how you should proceed in ministering to somebody. Mm -mm. But I want you to see the uninhibited response. Look at Abraham. Now, remember, he's 99 years old. These are 99 real years. Sound asleep, probably. Woken up from his siesta, verse 2 tells us he ran. Verse 6 tells us he hurried. Verse 7, he tells us he ran. Even the young man hurried to prepare it. So this guy was moving. How do we know he's 99? Well, what did the Lord tell him in verse 10? We didn't read it, but I read it partially to you, but he said, next year at this time, I am going to come and your, your wife's going to have a baby. And it tells us in chapter 21, verse 5, that he was 100 years old when the baby was born. So obviously he was either 100 years old or 99 years old. Nevertheless, at that time, 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him in this story. And he runs. He realizes the importance of the task before him. And he hurries. I want you to know that preparing for people that you're going to be hospitable to is going to take great effort. Amen. It's going to ask something of you. So you might as well just settle it now. And do it. Don't wait to the last minute. I, well, I'll, I'll get to this, but you... Number two, he bows in worship. He takes this as an opportunity to worship. This is more than normal hospitality for you and me. Anybody can be hospitable in this world, but you and I, we're, this is an opportunity for us to worship. Verse two, it tells us what does he do? 
When he saw them, he ran to the entrance, from the entrance of the tent to meet them, and he bowed to the ground. Now that might be more indication that we're not just dealing with angels. In Revelation chapter 1, it tells us in verse uh, 17 and 18, that when John met the glorified Lord, John's response was to fall on his face, and that's when the Lord reached to him and said, do not be afraid. But if you take your Bibles and turn in the same book of Revelation to chapter 19, verse 10, we will see that John is now in front of an angel. And what does John do? He bows down in worship. And what does the angel do? He says, oh, no, don't do that. Get up back on your feet. I'm a servant just like you. So we know in this situation, if those were just angels, they would have said, get off your knees and get back up. But the Lord was standing there. He recognized this as an opportunity, so he moved quickly, but it also was an opportunity to worship. Number three. Well, you know, this is a great opportunity for us to realize this is, we can worship all during the week just by being hospitable. Number three, he humbles himself. Matter of fact, that's the first time the Hebrew word worship is used in the Old Testament. Number three, he's, his humble service. Notice his humble service. Verse three, then he said, my Lord. That's a, that's a reference to anybody that you've given respect. But uh, nevertheless, he says, my Lord. He recognizes this guy above him, whether it's he understands him fully as the Lord, but he, do, he does know that there is an authority above him. And he says, my Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, please do not go on past your servant. I'm here to serve. Let a little water be brought to you that you may wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. Look at verse eight. What does he do? Then Abraham took the curds and the milk and the calf that he had prepared and set them before the men. He served them and they ate under the tree. He, 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 he it doesn't even tell us he ate. It just tells us he's, he served. He understood that service was important. <coughs> when we're practicing hospitality, be sure that you understand the value of that service. And I'm going to tell you what hospitality is at times. Hospitality is making someone feel at home when you wish they were. <laughs> It's service. It's, it's hard work. Number four. Now, that's no reflection on you guys at all. I just want you to know, right? Now. <laughs> it will be by the end of next week. Yeah. We have their, their, their son and, and their daughter and their three kids coming too. So by the end of next week, yeah, ask me again. Number four, I, I see a picture that he's generous here. Remember, that fits, that fits real well with the person who has the spiritual gift of giving. It's going to be natural for them to be very generous. You have to be generous in your provisions. Look at, look at verse six. Then Abraham hurried to the tent and said to Sarah, quick, knead three measures of fine flour. Give me, you know, that's like two pounds or, or two. I, I can't remember what, the, but the, it's, it's a lot of flour. But... Um, two measures of fine flour and make bread. Then meanwhile, Abraham, what did he do? He ran to the herd and got a tender choice calf. He, he didn't look around and say, boy, that one doesn't look like he's gonna make it. <laughs> he, he, he found the choice one. Yeah, that one's on its way out, might as well finish it off. But no, he, he finds a choice calf. They're having veal, calves liver. This is good stuff. Man. There's a difference between beef liver and calves liver, amen? There's a difference between veal and beef. And so they prepared it. Now notice in verse 8, he took the curds and the milk and the calf he had prepared. I wonder if his wife listened to him. I don't see any bread in the picture. <laughs> Somebody, she's too busy laughing, I think. <laughs> we'll find that out next week. But anyways, he's very, he's very generous in his giving. I, I, I understand what it means to be Challenged in the kitchen. <laughs> but I, I'm thinking, 
you and I, we could step it up a little. Even if you're challenged in the kitchen, you could do something to put love to what you do. When we do our potlucks, some of you do a great job expressing love. I know you put a lot of effort in what you made. And I realize what it's like to be busy and all you could do is run to the store and grab something off the counter and bring it to a potluck. But you go the extra mile when you actually bake something and bring it. I noticed the fresh baked goods this morning. That, that, that communicates loudly. You went, you went the extra mile to be hospitable. Now, I'm not, I'm not downing those who maybe buy things. I understand what it means to be challenged in the kitchen. I understand busyness of life, and that was the best you can do. If that's the best you can do, amen. But if you can do better and you don't, shame on us. Shame on us. We can do better, let's do it. Let's express generosity in the way we prepare for others. Enough said, right? Man, this guy, this guy worked. And then, and then the third, the, oh wow, is that three? Did I put three in your outline? Oh, you were supposed to catch that. You catched it afterwards? Okay. Well, we missed one here. Humble, generous. You got generous up there. All right, now let's go to the next one. There we go. Oh, that's cool. It spins like that. He conscripts his home. He involves the rest of the family, doesn't he? He involves his wife. Uh, oh, I'm telling you, when you're being hospitable, you need to involve the family. I, I, don't, I don't think God expects Martha Stewart in your home. I really don't. But I, I do think he wants others involved in it. it. It's okay to clean your house. But you remember, you're not, you're not here to show off the house you have. You know, you do want the people to feel comfortable. You, you don't want them to feel like they have to walk through uh, messes from animals that you live in your home. But, or your messes because you live in a home. But you know, you don't, you don't have to be perfect. But involve the family in it too. What a difference that will make when they see you exercising the ministry of hospitality and it rubs off on them. Remember, Christianity is more caught than taught. And so involve them. He involves his wife. He involves his servants. And everybody gets to work. Now comes the interesting thing. The hospitality is being done. And this guy's just sitting there waiting. He's waiting for God to do something. He knows this is a divine moment. I hope you anticipate the same thing. When you have the opportunity to be hospitable. If you don't have the opportunity, make it happen. Invite people to your home. Not just your family members, not just those you like. Remember what God's done for us. You and I, we have been offered hospi hospitality from God. We did not belong to the family of God. He opened up his home for us to come into. He even adopted us as his children. And it cost him an awful lot for that to happen. He gave his one and only son. So that not only we might be forgiven, but that we may also be joint heirs with his son. Everything that belongs to the son belongs to us. Amen. Folks, you don't, you don't see greater hospitality than what God did for us through Jesus Christ. You and I will reflect God's grace, his love, his mercy, Amen. his generosity. By the way, we exercise hospitality. Bye. Most of it's going to be probably planned, but there'll be those unexpected ones. Bye. Take the effort. Do what God did for you. Bye. And be hospitable Bye. to one another. Father, thank you. Thank you for reminding us of our wonderful privilege to reflect you to others. 
Lord, I know it runs against us and our human nature. Thank you for giving us your spirit, your nature, your characteristics that enable us to push past our flesh and to live in the spirit and to be hospitable toward others. Thank you, Father, for that example you have given us by inviting us to be a part of your home. Well, if there's someone here today that has not understood the hospitality that you offer through the great salvation in your son Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would speak to their hearts today. Those of us who have made that decision, you've offered us the opportunity to respond, and we have, but sometimes we just feel like we're orphans. Remind us again, Lord, how welcomed we are in your presence as we confess our sin, receive the cleansing. And Lord, you stand on the porch, welcoming us home. Lord, help us as a, a church family, that each person that comes in this place will experience true Christian hospitality as we do our best to meet the needs of their heart, just like you met Abraham's need. And Lord, he had everything. But he had that deep, deep sorrow of knowing that he had no son of the promise. And Lord, how you spoke to him and you met that need in his heart. Thank you, Lord, how you work in our lives. And thank you for this wonderful ministry of hospitality. I mean, we be faithful. In Jesus' name.